successfully created their final projects and now are proceeding to B-class. So, great for them. Uh, also, we have a four new remote classes which are also starting on Saturday. So, like, if, if you are a constant member of Vilna School of AI, you know that we tried to make the remote classes happen previously, but we just didn't receive enough interest. Now we have a full, uh, full-on remote classes, so I feel really glad about it. And uh, finally, uh, the last, uh, oh, I guess like the second to last thing is we, I think we outgrown our current budgets a little bit. So I'm looking for uh, sponsors and funding. So uh, basically I'm talking about uh, everything from starting from like European Union uh, funds to companies which are interested, which would be interested in uh, like paying for our pizzas and uh, like beer and during these events. So if you know companies or European Union funds or whatever, uh, please come talk, talk to me after this meetup and maybe next time we'll have some pizzas here. <laughs> 
And yeah, so uh, final thing, um, we have something huge in the works. Uh, right now I cannot yet tell you what it is, but uh, like please come to our next meetup, because then I'm going to announce it. And our next meetup is going to be on December. A lot of people are not doing meetups on December, but we are going to do it. So this December, like we are going to announce something huge. With that said, now uh, we have a presentation by our guest speaker. Uh, this is Ruth. He is uh, one of the most experienced guys which I know in artificial intelligence field. And uh, please give a big hand for him. Uh, I actually don't have it. So, so does this have to do with this? Yeah. And uh, I think let's uh, switch to. I will try to speak quite big. Okay. I'll speak here and I'll go back. And, and change the slides, okay? I'll try to not use this, but. Sorry about that. By the way, I can just say, uh, I'm glad to be in Vilnius. It's a great city. I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, and thanks for inviting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to see you guys came in this cold winter evening. <laughs> it's such a lot of traffic here. <laughs> I hope you'll find it useful. So. Yep, it's, it's coming shortly. Yeah, it will come soon. Or we can just make it full screen. Yeah, it's, it's right. I wanted to like make you mirror displays, but uh, okay. as you know, it's so, not making it easy. It's cool. easy for me. So I'll. <laughs> So I <coughs> the topic on one point. So I think it's it's important for for me to to tell you guys who am I, and and why you know why you should perhaps or why you want to listen to me. So I started working in AI way back in 2002. That when AI was not even you know any hype. And my first project uh, I was I was an undergrad student in India, and I started working on AI planning. I wrote a paper. I published a paper. I was 19 years old, I think, and, and a professor in Germany read that, and he asked me if I want to come to Germany and work for him. So that's how I first came to Europe, um, 2003, January. I started working in a project called RoboCup. So it was soccer playing robots. Anyone have ever heard about it or worked on it? So these are like robots which are playing football. And uh, that's my first like official AI project. I Before that, I also worked in IBM Research Lab. And then I worked on different um, universities in Belgium and Scotland. That's my, my, my background from 2002 till 9. Um, after that, I went and did my master's from Cambridge, and um, I built six startups. One of them was in machine learning. I will, do, I will talk about one of that also briefly. And since last two years, I've kind of pretty much uh, doing not much except for like, you know, I, I, I speak a lot, I write. Uh, I recently wrote a book. And I'm also a mentor. I was here yesterday uh, in the same venue uh, as part of Google Launchpad. So I'm a mentor of Google Launchpad. So I was mentoring a lot of startups, um, local startups. It was, was great. So it's, it's, uh, that's my background. And, and actually, the last point, I, I don't know if you could read it. So the last point is about building sustainable products using human-centric AI is what my focus is going forward. And I will talk about that part is how can we build sustainable AI products. Before I start, I, this is a question that I ask quite often. Why are we living? What's the purpose of us being in this world? Anyone interested to answer that question? I'll let you guys take five seconds, maybe one to think over. Anyone wants to, to answer? In general, we are ready to reproduce. <laughs> uh, that's when AI will not help, you know, I can see you that. <laughs> um, well, I, I would say just uh, to have like positive experience and uh, just to, to get uh, uh, these experiences uh, while you live in place. 
it can be different, you know, so uh, okay. visiting places, meeting people, doing some great things, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, everyone has their own reasons. I, I found that the, the biggest joy in life comes when you are able to do things which has impact or effect for others. Where you are not only doing things for yourself, where you are building products, where it could benefit society or other people. And I, I, and I want to talk about it because I think that's where there comes the question of, of creating impact. Because we want to build products that perhaps benefit people who are not so lucky or, or things that have, are, are broken. And that's the motivation of me being here or, or being, you know, uh, going forward in the next whatever foreseeable future is. So today I want to talk about finally is what are those kind of products that using AI could create the biggest impact. And then I'll talk about how do you go and build those products and overcoming some of the challenges that we will face or people face while building those products. Okay. So I, I start with, I, I like telling stories, so I'll start with telling four stories which I have faced in my life, and perhaps some of you have. I'm not sure how many of you, but. The first story is, is this. This is a, a picture taken from, from India. Um, this is a, a kind of environment that I have grown up. Lack of electricity. Um, growing up, I, was, I remember in the evenings I had no, no electricity. I had to study in such kind of plants. And not even now there are parts of the world that face the same problem. In fact, you'd be surprised to know there are over a billion people who don't have access to electricity. And perhaps a couple of more billion have lack of electricity. If we could solve this problem, that's an impactful solution, right? The second story, I'll just briefly talk about these this cases in, in a way for you guys to, to think, like, you know, what are those problems, big problems are out there. This is a picture taken from Vietnam. I was in Vietnam uh, eight months ago, also to speak in a, in a conference. And, and what happens in Vietnam is 70% of people don't have a bank account. And that's true for many parts of the world, not only in Vietnam, but specifically, let's say, Vietnam is an example. And when these people go out, and take a loan. Banks don't give them the loan. So they have to go in private and take the loan from private people. So this is one of those advertisements which says, in the, I'm sure no one reads Vietnamese here perhaps, right? <laughs> which says that these are the, if you want to take a loan, call this number. When these people who don't have a bank account want to take a loan in private, the amount of interest that they pay is around 80 to 100 percent. Standard interest is 10 percent. A big problem, right? That could be potentially solved. The third use case story, also this is something I have faced, perhaps many of you have faced. In the majority of the world, there are less than one doctor per thousand people. What does that mean? That if I have to go to a doctor or make an appointment, I might have to wait weeks, if not months. And the fourth problem is from Europe. And, and this, is a, uh, this is one of the companies that I have built. But, but this is a, a, a picture of a young driver. I think many of you are young drivers. I don't know how is it in, in Lithuania, but in majority of the Western world, if you are a young driver, you will end up paying more premium just because you are young. Right? That's not fair either. Because if you are young, you could be a good driver, but you still end up paying higher premium. So these are the four stories that I want to make you guys aware of to think that there are major problems in this world that are out there, which perhaps many of you are already aware of, could relate to or know about. Now, why these problems are out there? Of course, there's other aspects, but 
fundamentally what I think. What happens is that there are inefficiencies and limitations in the existing processes. And you can pick up any sector. You can pick up healthcare, energy, banking, insurance. I'll give you one more example from a Western world. I was in, in UK. First, when I went to Cambridge, to open a bank account, I needed an address. But to rent, an, to rent something, like to get an address, I had to have a bank account. Again, a cycle. So there are a lot of these inefficiencies, not only in the developing or the poor world, but also in the Western world. And perhaps you guys could already think of many of those in, in your country. Now why, if you think a bit further, and think why are there these inefficiencies? The reason is that most of this are based on limitations of human mind. Human mind have certain limitations, and I'll talk about briefly about them. And when we make those processes, we build the processes based on our limitations. For example, in Vietnam, if I want to take a loan, I need to have a bank account. Why? Because I, the bank can then look at my bank statement and say, oh, okay, this has been his income, this has been his, his salary, or that's, and okay, I can give him a bank loan or not. But if you really think, that's not really required. I don't necessarily need to know your bank statement to actually know whether to give you a loan or not. So a lot of these processes in different sectors are built by our limited limitations of our mind. Feel free to disagree with me if someone says no, and I'll be happy to, to, to understand. And what are those limitations? That we have biases, of course, that's one thing. There is something that, have, anyone have read this book called Fast Thinking, Slow Thinking? Okay, so, so you understand what I mean, that humans normally think very fast, make decisions without making an analytical, um, how to say, analytical decisions. You're not thinking about thinking through slow thinking that we call. We cannot deal with large and distributed data and we analyze very slow. So these are the reasons that because of all of these limitations, a lot of these processes that we have built in different sectors are built to fit to these limitations. I will give you a couple of puzzles to, to kind of argue further to, to show you how our mind thinks. So I will let you guys read it while I also briefly give you this, this puzzle. That let's say you bought a wine which cost $20 three, four years ago. And now the same wine costs $75. Okay? Now if you want to drink the bottle of wine, what cost will you assign? How many of you think it would be zero dollar? No one? Okay, only one. Okay, how many of you think it's 75 dollars? 75? Yeah. So, okay, many of you think, I don't know what are the rest thinking, but okay. <laughs> I mean, maybe this is a, a more smart audience and you know, they're more valid. But most people say it's zero dollar or minus 55. That's a part of human mind thinking, I bought something, it's already bought, it doesn't matter what is the cost, it is zero dollar. Economically, it doesn't make sense. The same question asked to the same people, but instead of saying you are drinking the wine, they say you broke the bottle of wine. And then what people said? Yeah, most people said 75. What I'm arguing here is that our mind are not thinking logically. We don't think logically. We don't make decisions logically. One very strong example I will give you, there was a story done in US in, in, in judicial system. There were uh, jury members. And they found out that just before the lunch, in the last one hour before the lunch, jury member hardly gave bail to anyone. But just after the lunch, the amount of went up for the 50 to 60 percent that, that they were giving bail. So what does it show? That because people are hungry, they were not keen to give bail to other people. Unfair, right? 
So human decisions, most decisions are actually based on other factors than what should be the factors. However, taking the further step a bit more arguing, it's not that human mind is all bad. I don't want to say that. How many of you have known this, have read about this experiment? It's called Galton experiment. So this is basically what they did is they brought a group of people like you and put an ox here and asked them to just guess the weight of the ox just by looking at it. And they found out that, that when they took an average of what people estimated, it was exactly the same, less than one you know, ounce, which is almost the same, what exactly was the weight of the ox. Now why I say this? Now this argumentation shows that human, this was not based on a logical thinking, this was an intuition. So what I'm arguing here, that although human mind have other issues, but we are very good at intuition, emotional intelligence, creativity. <clears throat> so now, think, a further step is, okay, we understand that human mind is, is bad at these things, we understand that human mind is good at these things. But can we build machines to help humans to solve or to improve our human decision making while taking advantage of our human minds, creativity, emotional intelligence, intuition, and getting rid of those bad decisions or the bad part of our human mind decisions? I mean, there are seats here, by the way, if you guys want to, I mean, oh, you can, you can move here, actually, there are some seats. If there's one seat here, I can just put it here. Okay? So, so, I mean, most of you understand machine learning, you know, I'm not, so understand what machine learning is, so, and I don't want to talk about AI because we all know AI is much bigger topic than the machine learning, right? So, most of you understand the difference between AI and machine learning. Anyone doesn't understand? Or maybe I should ask, how many of you do understand the difference of AI and machine learning? I think you can explain like Okay, short. so I'll briefly say that AI is a general, I've had a slide but I didn't put it there, but AI is a general purpose algorithm for building intelligence. There are different kinds of algorithms out there, genetic algorithms, I've worked on, on, on case-based reasoning, I've worked on, on planning algorithms, um, and machine learning is one of those algorithms, which basically is just learning patterns in data. So that's what we are talking about. The intelligence that we are talking about in terms of machine learning is learning patterns in the data, by and large. Now, why is that very powerful? Learning patterns is very powerful because there are patterns in almost everything that we do in our life. What we buy, what we, we, we wear, what makes us engaged, in fact, there's this quote by Jordan, who says that there are patterns in everything. There are patterns in books, human behavior, success, and everything in life. Now, we humans are not good at identifying those patterns because we are not, in our mind, because of the limitations that I said, not able to analyze those different patterns and then understand those different data. Some people are good at it. I mean, some of the best salespeople if you, if you read, there was a book I was reading by a guy called um, Mike Weinberg. Um, and he said that the best salespeople, what they do is they try to go and find those patterns. They write down those patterns and they look at those patterns. And, and if you read a lot of successful people, they say, we make our life patterns. Most of us don't, don't do those patterns and not understanding these patterns. So we are not good at doing that, the majority of us. But machines are. Right, so my argumentation here is, which, which there is a term called augmented intelligence, is can we find problems 
where we are basically combining the strengths of human intelligence and the strengths of machine intelligence to solve the major problems. And this is a very nice quote by, by Jimmy Rometty, who is the, the CEO of IBM. He said, some people call it artificial intelligence, but the reality is this technology will enhance us. So instead of artificial intelligence, I would think we will augment our intelligence. Now, this, 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 I just wanted to give this background to you guys to realize that there are many, many problems around us where there are problems out there, inefficiencies out there, and where, because of human limitations, we have broken processes. Now comes machine learning, primarily, which we could use to improve and fix many of those processes. Now, what kind of, and I'll give you four stories out of those. And all those four stories are basically could be improved upon using machine learning. I will pick two of those, because I, and which I'm closely working on, but I'm happy to, to share more if anyone wants to learn more about the other two. But moving back, that when I look at the problems, like what kind of problems are very good at using machine learning and basically combining human and machine intelligence together? And I have defined these, are, oh, these five conditions. And this is my definition, so if, if people may disagree, happy to, to, to hear this. So I say, first of all, you're dealing with a problem that requires has distributed data. You understand distributed data, right? The data is distributed in multiple places. The problem requires a high quantifiable, has high quantifiable data or patterns. Means there are aspects of repeated patterns in the problem that we are trying to solve. The third is there is a high human error. Now this is a very important point that I um, argue a lot. And, and I wrote an article um, about, uh, the title is catchy, but stop recognizing cats and dogs using machine learning. Now, how good are we humans at identifying a cat and a dog in an image? 100%. 100%. How good are we with speech recognition? Almost 100%. Now, do we need machines to do those things? I mean, I know there are cases, I mean, we of course can argue, but do we generally really need machines to do those things? And you can think about it, and I'm not saying that we do. I understand the need of using image analysis, and I will be giving a use case for that, but what I'm trying to argue here is, just don't use machines to say, oh, it's a great thing, oh, my, my, I built a machine that is recognizing cats in my image. What's the purpose of that? We don't need a machine to recognize cats in the image. That's one of the most, you know, I mean, and, and that's, that's where I'm talking about thinking through as an entrepreneur that are we building solutions that is creating value for the society? I read an article a week or two weeks ago that they are working on building a machine or a car to deliver pizzas at home. I mean, there are seven billion people out there. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people who are happy to deliver pizza to people's home. We don't need machines to go and deliver pieces. I, again, I, I, I understand there is a benefit of, of, of a research point of view, but as an entrepreneur, if you're building products, solving people's problems, there's a lot of problems that have a high human error, which I already gave you a few of those. So if you are thinking, okay, where can I find and use a machine learning thing? Is there already existing high error in the existing systems? And the fourth condition is, are there large amounts of data that can be generated or collected? That's primarily because we are using machine learning. Of course, AI algorithms could be built in future, which doesn't require that. I don't know the future. And, and there's a very nice quote by Jack Ma who said, there are no experts of future. So I don't know what will happen in 10 years. But I can tell you today, most of the algorithms that I use, or almost all, are machine learning. So that's why you need a lot of data. And the fifth point is, there is sudden requirement of human intelligence in the processes that is already there. So, what are those problems? I, I gave four. Anyone wants to think 
for five seconds, ten seconds, then think of any problem that does satisfy those conditions and that you can already think, ah, oh, maybe we can use machine learning there and improve the process. I'm sorry? Driving? Driving. Yes. Maybe traffic jams. So but we need to yes. like image recognition if for autonomous machines. But what problem is it solving? That's yeah. dangerous mm -hmm. and so on. And traffic yeah. problem. So Which problem? Traffic problem because they are not creating that many traffic jams. Security problems. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, I, I, we can discuss further on these, but you get that idea, right? You get the idea that there are, perhaps you could even think for a few more minutes and come up with a lot of different problems that you could solve. And that's actually, this, you are guys are sitting here, and that's very encouraging, because as a, as, as a group of young people, you have now, you should be like, wow, we can go and do things and improve the society, solve problems. And that, to me, that's like a very encouraging thing. Now I'll take the next step is, now I say, okay, I want to go and build those problems. I want to, sorry, to build those products to solve some of the problems. I, I, I will not go in much technical, but I will have those kind of quickly give you the, so that I have a full story flowing through. That what are the things I need to do? So I, there are these five steps. Which first, I talk about that you have to think about the use case. Then you think, what is the, how would you generally solve the problem? Then you identify what are those quantifiable patterns out there. And then the fourth step is you define what is the best machine learning algorithm for solving that problem. I do have a slide on that, but I will talk about it at the last one because I don't want to uh, talk that now. But the fifth step is you go and gather the data and train the model. Which step do you think is the most difficult in all of those five? First How, one. For, which one? First one. First. Yes. Gathering the data. How many of you think is the first one? Define the use case. Okay, two actually, three, four. How many of you think is the fifth one? A lot more. And what about the rest? <laughs> which one? <laughs> Identify the control value. Okay, in my experience, the most difficult has been the fifth. Mostly, I mean, of course, there are problems that you already have the data, but gathering the data is the most difficult thing that I have came across when you're dealing with problems. I, I can understand in certain use cases, of course, three could be a problem, even one could be a problem. But by and large, at least the ones I'm talking, going to talk about today, two use cases, the, the fifth has been the biggest problem. And this is something I repeatedly hear from different companies around the world. I was in, in Stockholm a week ago talking to Street Bank headquarters and the guy said, oh, well, how do we get data? How do we build products? So that's the, the common problem that I keep on hearing. So I will talk about, that's the one thing is, this, the biggest challenge is not technical. I know you are in a school of AI and you're trying to learn coding, but coding is actually not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge that I would say that how do you build products thinking how do you go and get the data? And how do I, you know, build, how do you mix different algorithms? And the cost is also another big challenge. So I'll give you two cases, which I'm working on. One of them I'm working on and one I've already worked on, which I'm primarily focused on solving the gathering data. I have a full chapter about overcoming that challenge of, of uh, gathering data, but I'll not go into those details, but in this talk, I'll just talk about two use cases and, and focus on a particular kind of data. The first use case is I'm working with students in India who have never met each other. It's like a, a community of students who are coming together to build a product to solve their problem. That's what I'm trying to do. And how it is doing, it's, it's, a, it's a case that I will try to argue upon. And, and how, how are we doing that? What are we doing that? Basically, the goal here is the first problem that we're trying to solve, is we are trying to solve the energy problem in not only in India, in the majority of the developing world, without relying on the governments or companies to solve it. 
We were saying, hey, there are young students, people come together, and let's solve a problem using machine learning, <coughs> partly, some way. So let me argue a bit further. I told you about the first problem, right? The first problem is the majority of the world has um, not that well access to electricity. One of the reasons for that is because you have to go back to 100 years or 120 years. How many of you know about the current wars? Not the movie, but two. Okay, so I'll briefly tell you about it. Current wars, basically, I think late 19th century, um, if I'm right, I think it was late 19th century, that there are two kinds of electricity, AC and DC. So AC is centralized system, high voltage, and DC is decentralized system, low voltage. AC was built by, um, I forgot the name. Edison. No, Edison was DC. Tesla. So AC was Tesla, and DC, DC was Edison. AC one. So the world that we ended up living is a centralized system where we have central system and this distributed electricity is distributed around to people's home. What's the problem with that? The problem is that if there are places in remote parts of a country, it's very hard to reach to those places. This system works very well when you have a city and you can build the production and you send it to the cities and people have it in cities. But when it's in remote villages and parts, it doesn't work. That's one of the reasons that electricity is not that widespread adopted around and in small villages. Now, but imagine that you are trying to build a future <coughs> where energy is cheap, clean, and abundant, and where each home or building is self-sufficient. Now, can we build such a future? What we do have are homes, rooftops of people. Every home people live, they have a rooftop. And what we can do is we can use solar panels on the roof. Now, let's say we can build such a system where, I'll, I'll briefly go further. So, where you can build a system, and what is the problem of solar adoption? When we look at the solar adoption in majority of the world, it's very low. Despite the price being quite low, because a lot of governments give a discount. The problem with solar adoption is, if I want to move to solar, especially rooftop solar, I have to invite, someone has to come to my home, he goes to my roof, makes an analysis of my roof, and gives me a report in a couple of weeks. And then at the end of the two weeks, I get a report saying, oh, this is much you can generate potentially solar. But that's a very inefficient process. That has a high human error in a way that the process is very inefficient, takes time, cost. Now, if humans, if I want to go solar, if I could just get the knowledge of how much energy that I can generate in my rooftop within a second, like knowing that, okay, I just go to a system and I say, okay, I know if today I had solar panels installed on my roof, it will generate this much of money this much electricity and this much of money outside. If I have this constant simulation of solar panels in my roof, it will greatly increase the adoption. Okay? So, a system that we could build is something like where someone goes, types his rooftop, his address, I have to go one bag and then get. And once you type the address, the machine, using the satellite images, scans the roof. Then it scans the rooftop area, finds the obstacles in the roof. And then all of this happens within a few milliseconds. But then it gives you an estimate that today, based on the amount of electricity, based on the solar, potential or how is the weather condition, this is the amount of energy that you could generate and this is the amount of money that you will save. This process would greatly improve the adoption of solar for people. So that's what we have seen now. So that would drastically, we think, will change 
people moving to a decentralized energy system. But what is the problem there? Now, this is not a new idea. I mean, Google is working on something like that called Google Sunroof. But the majority of the world in Western world, the pictures are something like this. And if you apply an image analysis, it will go like much better output. It will estimate the, the edges very well. It will find those obstacles. It will work very well. But that's how the, the world in developing world, the satellite images look like. Not like something like so clean and high resolution and clearly defined boundaries. This is how the world is. And when we apply the algorithms, like what we did on the previous one, this is the output we get, which is hardly doesn't work. And that's why we need to use machine learning. Because a machine can, I, there is a pattern in here also, you can see. This, it looks all clubbed up, but you can still see there are patterns. Patterns of roofs, patterns of obstacles, so we can potentially, a machine can do is something like here. You see the left-hand side of the image and the right-hand side of the machine can identify the root of edges, can identify the obstacles. Once the machine can do that, then we can estimate easily the, the potential of the root. And that's what we want to build. But first problem is, okay, I understand define the use case, but how do we generate the data for this? So what, because there is no data out there. So what we have to do is someone actually going and tagging the rooftop edges. So you can see that someone actually through a mouse click and he's identifying the edges and generating the data. And the goal here is to generate machine models where input is like that, the output would be a, a segment, there's something called semantic segmentation, I'm not going to technical details, but let's say, to, to identify the, the segments which are part of the group and then train a machine. And we're using a model called unit. For people who want to go into more technical details, there's an article I wrote about how are we doing that, but there's a model that we're doing a unit, which is basically training, this is the input output data, and we're training a machine to identify the rooftop edges. But of course, it looks good in theory. But how do we build such kind of, how do we generate that kind of data? And of course, as a startup, or there's a company, we don't have a lot of money, so how do we even generate, reduce the cost of development? So what we thought, that why don't we involve students, third year students, who have a reason to build such a solution, they could connect with the vision, they could connect with the mission of that, say, hey, we are, this is a problem we have, why don't we just come together, generate the data, and build a product. This is a quote that was written by a guy, a student, a fourth year. I'll let you guys read it. Where he says, any real world problem could be best solved if a group of people come together to put their dedicated efforts. When it comes to collective efforts of dedicated individuals, success is bound to occur. I didn't write it, there's a student who wrote it. And this is the, the model that we followed to build this product. And what we have seen, within, we worked for four or five months. So there was a student group of 50 to 60 students. Have no, like they have data science done some courses, but they're not like engineers, they're not like even PhDs. And the results that we have now is better than any other system that we are aware of in the world. And this is the kind of, you can see a, the target is basically what the human tagging output is and what the machine is predicting. So it's still under development, but we have around 70, 80% accuracy. So my, to this use, is showing you guys that it's possible, primarily because this, this is a great part of machine learning. That, that despite people saying that machine learning is primarily driven by data. The better data you have, the better output you will have. And most of the models are already open source. You don't need to be a, a, a rocket scientist or a PhD to use any of those models. So data, data you could generate by, by perhaps incentivizing a group of people to come together and build it. You already have the code out there which are open source. Train a machine and build a product. 
And this is the, the, the more details uh, article, which is the technical. So that's the first use case. That, that by simple doing with students coming together, we could build products. <coughs> and that's the, my, my whole argumentation here is. The second story, I will talk about the, the, the driving data in, in Belgium. That what we were trying to do, as I said to you, the, one of the problems is young drivers end up paying high premium because they're bad drivers. So how, can, how do you think is the best way to, okay, so my question is, what do you think is the best way to, to, to give the premiums? What is the best indication of how much one should pay <coughs> as a premium? What, should it be the age, or what, what should be the criteria? Probably kilometers driven without accident. Yeah, how good they are someone is driving, right? So what we said, okay, let's build a system. Instead of relying on some old fashioned age and things, we ended up building an app, that was 2013, so it's almost five years ago, which was tracking how people are driving based on four different parameters, as speed, acceleration, braking, and mobile usage. Tracking the data, how someone is driving, and then use the data to identify the, you know, the, the risk behaviors and people's behaviors. What is the biggest challenge here? Do you think it's a technical challenge? Or what, what would be the biggest challenge on actually building the system? Well, building and actually making it work, the system. Data. Yes. Why would someone share the data? I mean, it's a very private data. Where am I going, where am I doing, what am I doing? It's very private data. But what we did, that we, I mean, this is, we attached this with, with a bit bigger goal of the society. We said, be part of this, use the system, not only you will benefit, but you will also improve the society, make a better, safer rules. And that's uh, intrinsic motivation, so you understand humans have two different kinds of motivation, one is intrinsic, one is extrinsic. That was the intrinsic motivation, and the extrinsic motivation that we did was Basically, we said, drive well and get a free coffee. So we set some goals, like we saw Friday evenings people are driving bad. So we said, we set a goal saying, okay, if you score, we had some scoring system. So if you score more than nine on a Friday evening, you could get a free coffee. And we were surprised how much people are then willing to share the data and actually play the whole game. In fact, we have situations where we were using something called open street map, which is uh, let's say speed limit of the roads. If, if we had mistakes in those maps, like the speed limit, people will go, take a picture of the speed limit and send it to us. Say, hey, you know, we need a, the score is, is mistake. It's not, it shouldn't be 8.8, .8, but it should be 9.1. And then people were very willing to share data. How much was the data that we collected was, this is a three months period, I didn't update the latest slide, but in three months, we had almost three million driving kilometers. And I think in six months we had around five million. And not only that, so we have a data now, but we also saw that people end up driving better. I mean, that's a great use case, right? So we are making people drive better, we are collecting data, that data is very valuable for insurance companies. I have spoken with one of the biggest insurance company, um, I cannot name it, but the, the, the head of the insurance company, they said, we spend a million dollars to build, build such a similar system and only 300 people use it. And we had hard, hardly have any data. And we spend like around $40,000, which is one tenth or one fifteenth of, of what, or one twentieth, and we had much better results. Why? Because we involved the community. We understood what people want, we understood the, the, the motivations of people, we connected with that motivation, and then people are very willing to share their data, and then we could build the system. Now, in both the examples that I gave, what I tried to show you is that the challenge of building great systems, solving people's problem, using machine learning has the power to do that. And if you involve communities and people to come together, 
they will end up building products, sharing data. And that's very, very important in, in today's world. Why? Because, and this is an article I wrote, that one of the biggest challenges that how most of us do not trust Facebook, or most of us do not trust corporations. We do not want to give our data to corporations. We do not trust them. So we don't, we shouldn't expect them to solve our problems. And specifically because of, of machine learning, which is so driven by data, and the code are already open source, we all can come together and say, hey, let's solve this problem. This is our problem. Let's build a product and solve this problem. You may end up making money from it by selling it to someone, but that's a separate question. But that's, that's the vision that, that I think is very powerful. So to summarize, what I'm trying to argue to, first I showed you, look, there are limitations of human mind, there are broken promise, uh, processes around us in every sector. We could, machines can help us to improve and fix those processes. You'll be surprised at how many big companies are, are not able to do those things because, not because they don't have money, because they don't have access to data, they don't understand how to build such products, how to involve communities to build products. And banking sector is one of those big cases, and I work with a lot of banks. The second is, I always say, do not wait for governments and big companies to solve their problems. But build communities, start building products, bring them together, and solve it. So I tried to make a graphical view of this, which is to just make everyone understand, but it's not so good. So I said, you have a problem, you build a community around it, gather some people, could be anywhere, say, hey, this is my problem. Do you want to play part of it? You have certain, build some tools and processes, and we do follow certain processes that, that I, I haven't discussed that in this talk, but, and then with the mentoring and inspiration, you can build products. And it's a, it's a very different approach than what traditionally has been the approach. Traditional software development is a top-down approach, where someone goes and builds and then other uses it. Now I'm saying, no, people come, and share the data and build a product. And before I, I, I end this talk, I want to tell a short story. And why, why do we need a bottom-up community-driven approach? So this is a picture, I, I guess most of you don't perhaps understand the meaning of the picture, but this is a story was, I, I listened to a, a talk, it was 2010 in, in Cambridge, and a, a, a guy from MIT came. And he said, we were driven by solving a problem of charging batteries in Africa. Because in Africa, you don't have again all these charging points, so people in the remote villages are not able to charge their mobiles. So let's, we wanted to solve that problem. They went and spent a million, million dollar, one million dollar, to build that product, which is basically kind of something like a box, and you, you turn with your hand, and it, you can then charge uh, your mobile. And, and it takes an hour to build, to charge your mobile fully. So they went to Africa and said, now we solve the, the big problem in the world. So Africans must be very happy. And then they went and they saw that they had already solved the problem. What they're doing is they're using the battery of the car to charge their mobile. Which is like ridiculously cheap. Now he said, and, and I, I remember he said that, that this is how the bigger problems in the world should be solved. And in the era of machine learning, primarily because of the power of data, it has even more to be possible to do that. So yeah, I will, I, I think that's where I want to end my, my talk. This is a book, I don't write about it, but feel free to connect if you think there's something interesting. Um, and yeah, that's, um, that's the end. I mean, if people have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer or, or do, do it via... Sure, so first of all, thanks for a great talk. Uh, now we have Augustinus and he's going to do uh, Q&A with all of you and with you. We have one microphone, right? Yeah, we only have one microphone. I can shout it. 
You can hear me, right? You can maybe share. I can share. Okay. Right, good evening, everyone. So uh, once again, thank you, Ruth, for uh, all the insights and all your experiences. Um, to say short about myself, my name is Augustinus, and I'm a founder of Vilnius AI. I do have a member in the audience from the same group as well. And I am an um, AI enthusiast. I do find AI fascinating, and I went down the rabbit hole looking for answers. And what I found was more questions. So basically, I really hope uh, Ruth is going to help us to get more insights about entrepreneurship and practical AI applications. So without any ado, maybe anybody from the audience has more questions. Wonderful. How many good samples should you provide the machine to train to recognize some patterns with quite well? Uh, depends on the problem. But let's say if I talk about this, uh, the solar one, the rooftop that I said, we had around 1,000 to 2,000 rooftops. And we already have around 80 to 90% accuracy. So what happens with machines is that to reach to 80 to 90% accuracy, you don't need a lot of data. But when you want to reach 90 to 99 or 95, that comes much more difficult. Or from 95 to 99, even more. So for example, I would say if I want to build a system to do a speech recognition, we expect that to be 99 to 100% accurate. Now that's a very difficult problem to solve. But in other problems where there are already like 5% accuracy or 10% accuracy, you don't need a lot of data to, to build a system which is like 80 to 90% accurate. Uh, just to top it up the question, um, how much data do you need to make an initial prediction? Because we're talking about a lot of different problems and we do understand that data is very important. So initial prediction, how many data points would you suggest going for? But what kind of prediction? For what purpose? Data points. Just to get that initial algorithm going and give you feedback. So I'm, for example, give you an example. Uh, one of the problems that we're working is in predicting buying behavior, right? So let's say I want to predict the next buyer. Um, in those cases, we have around uh, 10, like the initial prediction works around say, 15, 20,000 data points where we could collect the data and we could predict somewhat works well. So it depends on problem to problem, algorithms you are using. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I would say that to reach to a, a precision of 80 to 90 percent, you don't need like millions of, of data points. Very good insight, and the bad in mind, you mentioned you had six startups, was that right? Yes. And did you work with any of them? You mentioned one of them was on based on machine learning, right? The one with the car. The that's one with the car. The that's car, that's one I started. Okay. Wonderful. So can you give us more insight about the initial stages of bringing it to life? Actually, I imagine there's a lot of people here curious, how do you develop an AI startup, for example? And where did you start? Well, it's the same. I mean, every company that you start, you start with a problem, right? You identify a problem that you want to solve. You see an inefficiency in the market, and you say, okay, we want to solve that problem. So we saw the inefficiencies. Young people should not be paying more money. It's an inefficient system. Roads are unsafe. Belgium is one of the worst road safety records in Europe, other after Greece. So I said, okay, let's solve this problem. How do we solve it? Why don't you make people you know, uh, track how people are driving based on that, then we give you five, make them better drivers. So you always start with a problem, and then you go about solving, understanding how do you go and solve the problem. Of course, we didn't know that we have to build a community. Of course, we didn't know at the beginning that we have to give me five. So it was a lot of trying and failing. And always. Like all I mean, there's a great, I, I didn't have a slide which was about uh, Seth Godin. He said something, ah, oh, this was for my talk tomorrow in Prague, Google. Sorry for that. So I'm speaking tomorrow in Prague. Um, so there was a said Godin who says success is defined as something like the more so, so someone who fails more succeeds. So your success is defined by who has failed more. So that's basically what it is. Well, that's a good insight too. And uh, keeping in mind that bringing something to an actual product requires not just an idea and hard labor, but it does require a right team. How did you choose the right members? Because uh, we do have in mind that tech uh, and tech partner, tech. tech Tech people are very uh, scarce resource. Well, um, I don't agree that tech people are a scarce resource, by the way. Especially in machine learning, because a lot of this code is open source. I don't need a very high tech person to build most of these products. So that's the first thing. Um, it was never, the, for us, the biggest challenge of hiring someone is not the person of technical. What I look for whenever I work with someone, I wrote an article about it that why I want to work with people who do not want to work hard. 
And I would never work with someone who says, I want to be rich, I want to be successful, I want to be famous. Because that's the wrong motivation. The, the only criteria that I look for, not only, the most important criteria I look for is motivation. Right? So, I give, I, someone asked me the same question like I was in Berlin like last week, and I said, one of the things I asked, if you want to work with me, shall we meet on a Friday evening, 9 p.m.? And if the person says, no, I'm sorry, I'm going for a club or I'm going for a drink, I said, okay, I'm not the, then I'm not, you're not the right person to work with me. So motivation is the number one criteria that I always look for. Please. Perhaps anybody else has some questions? Wonderful. I have a question regarding the, it's not, the question regarding the data driving project. Uh, did you succeed in your, in your goal of convincing the insurance companies? Yes. We had pilots with a couple of insurance companies. Uh, I, would, I, cannot, I don't think I can name them. One was in Brussels. Uh, one was the, one of the biggest insurance company. And I, I didn't actually go further how we did implement the whole POC. And I, I, wrote, I, I wrote an article about successful adoption. What we ended up doing is those uh, insurance, that insurance company sending physical letters to their uh, like the clients. Then people signed up, we ended up using it. I left the company in 2016. Uh, two years ago. Uh, at that time, it already got acquired 50% by another uh, company, so I left it. But but yeah, there was a proof of concept that insurance companies are very keen to use it. And I think now we, that company is already doing a proof of concept with some in France, um, perhaps Netherlands. Yeah. So the insurance companies agreed to use this app as a way of measuring how much Under their white label solution, yes. So that's, that's a great success. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, going back to the initial stages again, uh, once you start working with the data, you need to keep in mind the metrics. What metrics did you ch did you focus most initially? Um, of metrics for what? For the the machine learning output uh, for the car as part of your data. Um, like, do you mean whether it's able to predict or what? Uh, yes. I, no, we were not using prediction at the beginning, right? We had no data. So our initial metric was, can we get the data? Can we make people share the data? That was our main metric. How many users are using it regularly? How many people are actually sharing the data? That's the main metric that we were following. Once we got the data, what actually we saw, that insurance companies actually using that for prediction was not something that they would do that. It takes ages for them. But they were very driven by the, they were very enthusiastic about the fact that we could build a community of young people who are using a product and sharing the data. That itself was a very big success for them to understand that thing. So for us, that was the, the main criteria. That can we build a community who are using something and sharing the data? Now that's the criteria. Now, whether we end up using the data for reducing the premium was something that is much more complicated for them. But we, what their idea was that can we create gamification to incentivize people, even if it's not reducing the, the, the premium rapidly, but let's say just do small things. Like, you know, um, can you, if you drive better, you get something in return. Something like that kind of gamification. It sounds like a lot of like growth hacking. Yeah, it was a growth hacking, of course. Yeah. All right, perhaps anybody else in the audience has a question? Any brief souls with a lot of interesting questions? There we go. Uh, so uh, you said that uh, maybe I missed, but uh, how much money do you need to start uh, just this uh, type of, let's say, AI startup? So uh, this one, one, one. How much money do you think we we use to build such a system? Can someone guess it? Yeah. Zero. Oh, we spend a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> but zero. We don't make people yeah, students work for free. You know, we give them something. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, for six months, uh, we spent around like thousand, two thousand dollars, and that's the kind of data we are talking, and the amount of money that we're talking about. When you, you know, that, that's a that's a that's a great thing about human society that when you connect people at the motivations which are not just intrinsic, not only extrinsic but intrinsic. Like we all have a reason to be part of something bigger. We all have a reason to, to do something great. Connect with those motivations. And then you will surprise. I mean, for this one, when we, I was building, I had over 1,000 students applying to work on this for free. They wanted to work for free. 
So I ended up talking to around 300 of those and we ended up selecting 50 to 60. Out of which only five and six actually get a monthly stipend, which is I think around $50 a month. The rest just work for free because they are learning something, growing something. The biggest challenge of machine learning when I talk to students around the world is, they say, okay, we have done some coding, we have done some Kaggle competition, we know how to predict how many survivors will be in Titanic, but <laughs> what's the purpose of, I don't see how can I use it in real world problems. And that's a huge gap. So once you give them the opportunity to work on something real world, which they can connect with, you'll be surprised how many people want to work on it. And that's, that's as if you're an entrepreneur, if you want to go, hey, can you do that? It's a great opportunity. In fact, today I was talking with, I don't think Max is here, with, with someone from Google, and, and we were talking, hey, can we do this in Belarus? Like, you know, he's from Belarus, he works in the Google office here. I said, yeah, why don't we just do something like that? Students come together, they build products, and they will be happy to be part of that. So yeah, that's the kind of money you're talking about. But what about, uh, let's say, the environment where these type of people should, you know, they don't have these skills, uh, how to do that, so someone uh, should, like, show them, uh, mentor them, and, uh, and so on, so uh, okay. a, few, a few words on that. Uh, so, uh, uh, asking a second question of that, how much time do you think I actually end up spending with these students who are working on this project? What would be, mm -hmm. yes, like every week? All your time. <laughs> no, actually I, I, I work, I will say uh, on a daily basis less than one hour. That's again the beauty that what has happened and when I, this is so fascinating when I look back 15 years ago when I was studying, I didn't have access to education in the way that students now you guys have access to education. Like there's so many great online courses, there's so many things out there. You don't need someone to anymore teach. I mean there's a, there's a great talk called School in the Club and anyone have seen that? I would highly recommend to go and type it and, and school in the cloud. What he says that the best schools are not when someone is teaching someone something. The best schools are when you bring people together who are highly motivated and let them learn from each other. And someone is just encouraging them. Oh, okay, you're doing good and you're doing that. That's it. And that's what the model I'm following. And they are much better than me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know what model they're using. They, they go read papers, they, they are, as I said, everything is open source, they, they do courses online, and they are building the system. You don't actually need anyone to, to really tell them what they do. But at least guide, you know, it's a much quicker way to achieve something. Like yeah, I mean, to some extent, yeah. But I, I believe that the purpose of all of this is not just to build a product, but also to make education, as, as make it more widespread and make people give opportunities. And I think, Somewhat, I find beauty in, in, in making them learn by themselves. Primarily because it's, and there is guidance anyway in the internet. You know, you go and type something, people are willing to anyway happy to help. Um, and I, I'm surprised sometimes they like, bother me on Friday evening at 1 a.m. And, you know, and they're like, hey, let's have a call and something. So, so yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's a really powerful way of, of building products. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? Were you were using the gamification to collect users data where the user is aware that it's going to be used for other purposes later on? Or the... Did you ask me whether we used it or whether... Yeah, well, you used users data, you asked the users data in return for, as I said, cups of coffee if they were. Were they aware that this data will be used later on to kind of for the insurance purposes? Yeah, they were. So that was one of the uh, interesting motivation that they want to make, you know, insurance premiums low. That's yeah. It actually follows up on the question of GDPR, which most of the people heard about. Yeah. Uh, since your startup was in Belgium, so it does have to comply. Did you face any issues? Well, I, I, it was 2013 to 16. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so just to get it straight, you finished that one, right? Well, I left the company in 2016. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Okay, so I will not say something that I don't want to be in public to me. <laughs> if you want, if you, if you promise that you will remove that. We'll, we'll make the noise. <laughs> okay, so I think that GDPR is, is BS, basically. Less? I mean, I think, I think at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, people are, if you 
give people reason to share the data, people are very happy to share the data. But you have to give them the right reason. The problem has happened, a lot of companies are misusing the data. Mm -hmm. But I think the GDPR is way too, um, much bigger than what, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I, I would prefer to talk about this in private rather than in public. <laughs> <laughs> I saw another question right here. Which way is better to build such project, Agile or Waterfall? I think Agile is always a better way. I mean, a Waterfall is, you know, with students and lean methods is the best way to build this product. You cannot build startups in what for months. I have a question about the ethical side of things, which often comes up when dealing with machine learning and personal data. If you if you would ask most people here, say a few years ago, would you be willing to share all your writing data with the insurance companies? You would get lower premiums. I imagine most of them would even today say, hell no. But in this scenario, you've managed to, uh, using gamification, you've managed to motivate people to share their personal driving data free. And they were happy to do it, even knowing that it would be useful in the end. Do you feel that there's kind of an ethical dilemma involved in this? You're kind of encouraging people to overshare or maybe tapping into something that's a bit too private. In this case, they were just sharing all the destinations, all their locations, where they went, from how fast they went, and where they stopped. Which is well, it's still kind of personal data. Of course. And when if you try to, for example, solve solve problems in the medical sector, you would end up even deeper in the privacy nightmare. Do you ever feel kind of uneasy about that? Is there a way to approach it? That doesn't that doesn't disrupt, doesn't need to sleep poorly at night. <laughs> well, my my approach to that always is be honest and upfront to the to the people. Don't do things behind their back. Make them aware what they want to do. Understand their motivations. What are their key motivations and connect to those motivations. So if you are somewhat right, if I would gone to them and said, hey, um, share your data, and then we'll go to insurance companies, and hopefully they will reduce your premium in five years. No one would share the data. But when I said, well, it's not just about a free copy or free tickets, but also improving the road safety and, and making the road safer. And, and then hopefully the companies will come and reduce the premiums. You are connecting to different motivations or different layers of motivation. And, and that people connect well, or at least we saw people did connect well um, in that kind of thing. So my point would be answer that is be honest and upfront. And if you really understand what people's motivations are, you will see people end up doing things for you. I just out of curiosity, did you share the raw data with the insurance companies no. only your conclusions? No. Just persons in the scores and yeah, the of course, of course. But the, the raw data has no value for us anyways in general. It, it, it was actually more valuable. We didn't even need that where they are going, what they are doing. It was the users wanted to have that. What we ended up seeing that they wanted to see why my score is nine and why not eight and where is my score less. So they actually had a reason to see that. We, we didn't need that in a way to show them, but they wanted to see that. Thank you. So, you know, you, yeah, to make them a better driver. So they could say, oh, we are driving here back, we are driving. So that's how it was. And unfortunately, we're running out of time, so it's time for the last question. Does anybody have it? All right. I didn't get the full question. Can you repeat the question in the beginning? Yeah. Do you, uh, in general, do you think the, the big players should be involved in AI development? Huh. Well, I, I'm no one to say whether someone should or should not be involved in, a, in the AI development, right? So I'm not the right person to answer that question. However, I do think that, the, again, AI, when I say, I will not talk about AI because it's too broad, right? So there are parts of AI which is um, doing research, understanding, many things, but just machine learning. Um, I, I think that there is a reason that biggest disruptions happen not from big companies. Because big companies are too big to see 
the small, you know, the disruptions that happen, right? So I would say that disruptions in machine learning would mostly come from small players or startups. Big companies don't have perhaps that kind of uh, motivation to solve the low hanging fruits where I think the biggest opportunities of machine learning are. Google is too busy building an autonomous car and, and delivering pizza to your home, uh, which is okay, but I don't think that is a big value society for the majority of the world. Um, I work with banking sector. Banking sectors are also have the problem. For them, the biggest challenge is how do we build this kind of product which are making people share the data, make people use the data, or sorry, uh, do some predictions, building products. So I, the way I see that going forward is where a lot of small companies and startups will start solving those problems, and that will be the, the, the future of, of machine learning. And this is true for any technology disruptions when it happens. Often it doesn't come from the top, it starts from the bottom. Right, I hope that answers your question. And just to add it up, uh, most of the corporations, they do have AI as a hot topic. Unfortunately, it's only at the executive level. And uh, this year, a couple of months ago, we went to World AI Summit in um, Amsterdam. And we've been presented with a lot of companies throughout over 177 countries. Uh, well, sorry, 170 countries. And what happened was that majority of innovation, as Ruth mentioned, was happening at the startup level. So a lot of corporations are looking to acquire uh, smaller players, looking for their development, and this is the way to go. So I'm really interested about uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial side and see how it goes in Lithuania as well. So thank you very much again, and I want to give back the mic for Dominic. <laughs> to the second part, uh, but we have like a five minute break. So.
you have to spend a lot of time. Uh, there is a lot, of, there are a lot of great sources currently available for free online. So our first principle is we don't create content, you learn uh, from like what's, a, what's already available. Our second principle is we are practical. Uh, I mean there's some value in learning theoretical aspects behind artificial intelligence, but in my mind, I most much more value if you are able to build something with what you know. I mean, it's very good if you can like write a research paper, but you cannot code to save your life. I, I much more prefer if you will be able to join like a startup, something like what, for example, Rude is doing, and deliver value to that startup, being able to be that guy or that girl who reads the paper, implements the new research uh, thing in code, and like makes, uh, makes an app which makes money. Okay, so we focus on that. Our first, third, like principle is to maximize your success rate. And what I mean by that is we try to do whatever it takes, like to, to solve the process in a way that you will have like a maximum chance of success in a way that you will, you will learn how to code artificial intelligence systems. Uh, like there's there there's has been a confusion between, like in, in this uh, area, and some people are saying more well, mostly like, oh, so the person like so if you like you have to struggle in the beginning, okay? So I'm not going to show you how to do that because you know like you have to show your character and like do the, the like eighty percent of the research on your own, then I'll help you in the end. So I am not believer in that. I believe that it's actually hardest to start. So we, we really will focus on helping you to take the right steps from the very first step to the very last step. Uh, we'll, help, we'll tell you what steps to take, but it's up to you to take them, okay? And finally, we use Agile and Lean principles for your like learning. Uh, I mean, I love Agile. I think it's the best thing ever. Uh, I think like the only thing which is better maybe than Agile is Lean. So I try to combine all these things into uh, like your, your learning process and uh, in my experience it works like great. So we try to use them a lot in what we do. Now, uh, let me tell you about, uh, there are actually two ways in which you can learn. There are regular classes and there are remote classes. So first, let's talk about regular then you can decide which one is, is best for you. So regular classes are for people who want to like, who can commit at least 10 hours per week for learning artificial intelligence. Okay, that, I mean like, you have to have 10 hours every week and week in, week out. So that's the first requirement. Uh, you will be grouped into squads and you will meet every Saturday. During this uh, like Saturday sprint meeting, uh, you will get uh, like your sprint objective, which you have to like achieve before the next sprint. You will work as a squad and you will provide support to your squad members. And squad is like 14 or 16 people. Uh, they will help you out, you will help them out, okay? You will also help out other squads, which will be learning the same thing. And finally, uh, and most importantly, you will have a good time. Okay, uh, now let me tell you about remote squads. That's for those people who cannot commit 10 hours a week. Or like one example, you can commit like 40 hours a week, or you can commit two hours a week, right? If you diverge very far away from this 10 hour like requirement, I would recommend going for a remote squad. There you get the full curriculum, so we have like I, I manually pick the best courses for your level based on your experience and uh, like I, I make I structure the course how how to learn it what to do after after what and what resources to use so you will get all of that immediately and then it's up to you to continue to learn it on your own pace finally 
you will be uh, not in a squad, but you will be part of a class that's like all the people, all the squads combined, basically. So you, you will have access to every squad member, also to all the other people who are working remotely. And finally, you will have a good time too. So that's the main differences. Do you have any questions about uh, remote squads versus regular squads? there really because I know that a lot of you do have questions right after the end of the presentation so please ask now because uh, it's really important because every like a lot of people have the same questions so if you ask now I won't have to repeat the same thing like three times okay very good go how will how we will select the goal I will select the goal for you based on your experience let's say you are like I, I'm, I just want to say I don't know what, what your current uh, level is, but let's say you are new to code and you don't know Python programming language, right? Uh, given that, you will start from the very beginning. You will learn how to, first of all, how to program, how computers, like computer programming works in general. You will, at the same time, you will be learning Python, which we will be using in like uh, higher classes. I will tell about classes like in a second, but basically like in short, you will progress from lower classes to higher classes. And after like graduating from uh, the highest class, you will be able to, you will be like an AI expert, ready to join the startup. Does that answer the question? Any more questions? All right, so let's move on. Uh, I promised to tell you about the classes. So all in all, we have five classes. And all of these five classes have different objectives. So we can see them right here. Uh, can I like very quickly do a poll? Who thinks here they are, they should be in D class mm -hmm. that is learning how to code, as in people who don't know how to code? All right, a few of you. Uh, whom of you uh, think you are part of the C class and that is people who are professional programmers or at least know how to code well but we don't know how to code in Python. I mean you are a developer but you are like a PHP developer, JavaScript developer, Java developer, not Python developer. Alright, a lot of you. Uh, the third, the D class, the, sorry, the B class is for people who are Python developers, but we are not part of data science. Uh, I mean, you are like, for example, Django developer. A few of you, very good. Uh, like A class is you are a data scientist, but now you want to learn the newest and greatest machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence uh, methods and projects. Okay, not, not a lot of data scientists here today. <laughs> uh, finally, S class, that's uh, like usually nobody starts in S class. Uh, you will move here after A class, and here, uh, it's, this, is one, this one is reserved for people who want to do artificial intelligence projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a way what uh, Ruth said today, like students who want to apply their knowledge on real life problems, okay? So that's the S class. You might be working as a like deep learning engineer, artificial intelligence engineer, but you still need a community to like give you support, give you like uh, new insights on uh, how to solve s certain types of problems. So that's the S class. Now let's uh, like I'll very quickly go over the curriculum of each class. So D class, again, you have to learn how to code a bit Python, and your only requirement is motivation. That's uh, ten hours for regular classes and as many hours as you want for remote classes. The duration of the program is twelve weeks, and you will progress directly to B class. The C class it's twice shorter. So it's only six weeks, but you have to know how to code. You will always also progress directly to B class. After C class or D class, you will go to B class or 
course directed to B class. This is the data science track. Okay, here you have to have good Python skills, and you learn all the prerequisites before machine learning. It will take you like 22 weeks to, to do that, and you will move to A class, which very focus on deep learning. And after 17 weeks, hopefully you will be ready for S class. There you will be working on, on artificial intelligence projects forever, like in, infinite weeks. So, uh, since most of you are here for the information, uh, those of you who uh, are starting on Saturday, good, like lucky you, uh, the next session launches on January. Uh, who would be interested in like joining us? Uh, Oh, by the way, I always forget to mention that it doesn't cost you anything, and all of that is free. Okay, just before before I go, I ask this question, so everything's free. So, who wants to join the next uh, band, the next session of January? Very good. So, what you have to do is you have to join our Slack group because all the information is on Slack. Uh, the reason. Why we do that is because like I cannot use emails because emails uh, like they are so so unreliable. So many of my messages are go going to spam for like no reason. Uh, so if you join Slack, you are sure to receive all the information. Okay. So how to join Slack? I will post the link today on the meetup.com and on the Facebook event on the Facebook group. So if you are part of one or the other, you will be able to access to join our Slack, and here you, you and there you will get all the information about our workshops. And uh, all the information will be in general. Do you have any questions? Could you please share these slides? Yes, they, I will share the slides, also the video. If uh, like you'll remove the GDPR part, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they will be on Facebook only. Uh, do you plan? Do you plan to make some reviews of what you've done, what was successful? Just for for somebody who's not uh, interested in coding, mm -hmm. just to, to know what what's the experience in local market is. Uh, you mean in organizing these courses or no, like no, meetups? In, uh, in expertise of people who are making some, some practical applications of AI. Uh, I actually don't have any plans though, so. so but we can talk like after the meetup, maybe I'll get what you mean better. Mm -hmm. I saw a question right here. Here you go. If you are a highly motivated individual who did not get assigned to a squad, but really, really would like to be assigned to one, can you like show up to another squad meetings or get assigned if someone else drops out, something like that? Uh, there is this possibility, but that's honestly, it's not a high chance. What I would do in your like uh, place is so you can go on the remote squad like be sure to follow like at least be a little bit ahead of what the normal like regular squads are doing if there is this opportunity i will share it on the class channel be sure to be the first who replies i want to be it okay because that that's expected like at third week that uh, some people who, who can kind of cannot spend 10 hours we just kind of thought they can spend hours per week but really cannot. So at the third week, they drop out, and that's where you can join it. Okay. And I saw like one more question there. So uh, if I understood correctly, uh, there seemed like a large gap between these two first classes. Uh, you have to be. You mentioned that you have to be an expert in some uh, language. It doesn't matter which one, Java or C sharp, but then learn basics of the Python in four or so weeks. So does, is it really so necessary to be an expert in uh, 
it's like so the, there's the threshold right I say if you use it professionally for six months so if you use it professionally for six months go to C class if you use it for less than six months professionally or you are a student or any other case go to D class uh, so but did you say that these classes are you mostly know these concepts uh, just in a different language or so but is, is, is there a possibility to progress uh, faster? Uh, no, no, with regular squats, one squat is a unit and unit is indivisible. Uh, don't worry, there is a lot of extra work to do if you feel that you have extra time. That's always an option. Uh, sure. Saturday sessions, if I understand that uh, our week it will be Saturday sessions, how long is planned? How many hours it takes on Saturday? Uh, 55 minutes. And uh, like just to be sure, we are not learning on just these meeting. 55 minutes. We are meeting, we are deciding on the objective, we are talking about the courses which you are doing, we are talking about your progress, we are basically making adjustments to your learning curriculum. So 55 minutes. So it's like a, a general standard, if you know, once per week? Uh, yes, but it's like more like a sprint planning, sprint retrospective, and sprint like a grooming all at the same time. Right, so if you don't have any more questions or you don't want to share with them, like share them publicly. Uh, that's it. Thank you all for coming and uh, see you at our next meetup on December. So industrial IoT, in fact, it's just being called industrial IoT. Maybe industrial IoT. Okay. Okay. Cool, because I am more like from the uh, laser sector, so we're producing already yeah, like uh, optics, call call laser uh, applications. And, and it's, uh, one thing is uh, that yeah, we we have quite uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, discrepancies and, and so on. So we're just thinking how how we can like uh, adapt to it. Uh, but of course, it's very interesting. Uh, what is the, the minimum necessary data? Uh, you know to to, uh, to teach uh, the, the it depends, there's no answer to that question really like it's hard to answer it but it, it depends on what you're training it could range from thousand data points or even thousand fifty thousand or even something else but again what kind of data you're collecting it's a standard answer mm -hmm. a lot of IoT companies have put sensors in this company if you want I can connect to the guy if you add me on LinkedIn I'll connect kind of without mentoring him yet so he's basically using sensors he has installed sensors in factories in Finia and collecting the data 
application. Basically, they're trying to do some kind of data application, and then the next phase will be production. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the interesting and, and another topic is which is my personal passion. So uh, it's you know about uh, uh, longevity. Uh, so I'm curious how how it's possible you know to find the way and uh, let's say cure aging. You know because cure yeah. aging. Yeah, aging. Because you know most of uh, right now scientists uh, admit that uh, aging is like a disease, not like a normal process. So. Um, and of course, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, stuff and information, and uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, what is related to the, with, uh, with the body, all the processes inside, like genes and so on. So, uh, did you have any experience in this field? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but I know there's a lot of people using in biomedical or DNA. Again, there are patterns. Basically, when you think about things, there are patterns, try to find them. Where can you use it? You know, you can if there are things you could use the pattern to recognize, if you detect something and then you can help to predict or to switch uh, it, then, then yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know in your case, you know, I'm not too many experts. So, uh, it's just, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing like to contribute to society and I, I think, you know, if, uh, like you mentioned, like uh, to, to, to find the idea which, uh, you know, can motivate people to, to do stuff uh, which uh, it's not like personal or like to profit of course, of course. Who doesn't want to, to like a bit longer and so on? So probably. Yeah, there's profit part. Yeah, it's just profit profit. But a way to do it is to get into the way to do it. Great. Okay, so and you you said uh, you are here like first time in in, in yeah. this. Okay, so you came yesterday to, to give a pitch. Uh, so. No, yesterday I came here for the Google um, mentoring. Mm -hmm. So there was some startups from here. I'm, I'm here at Kalyan today and tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. I'm flying to Prague. Tomorrow I'm giving a talk in Prague. So so usually you you do like uh, all these things going like uh, taking these keynotes and uh, doing presentations and, and uh, doing also some uh, mentoring. Or you have yeah, yeah, your own like kind of some business or startups? No, I don't have any startups. Yeah, it's almost two years now. Okay, so uh, what's your own uh, like purpose, uh, like goal? Uh, I, I think I like uh, sharing what I think is valuable for the society, and you know, I find it inspiring when I meet a lot of people who want to build products. So for me, the purpose of this is you know, inspire people. Maybe they will go and build something, you know, interesting. And tomorrow I go and meet ten startups in Prague. And I was in Berlin before coming here. I came here from Berlin, and Berlin I spoke in a data science conference. And a lot of people love this idea of like kind of you know how communities can be used and someone is using it. Yeah, that's purpose. Sharing okay. knowledge. So can I keep in? Uh, yeah, please add me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Cool. So maybe you know it would be valuable for both sides. Maybe. Great. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
Žiuosiu, 